Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, tracking NJ transit troubles. The long-awaited audit of New Jersey Transit confirms it was starved for cash and badly run. How to fix it? The governor's not ruling out a fare increase next year. A networking event in Trenton shows considerable hope for a capital city turnaround. New technology means new capabilities for the blind and visually impaired at the Newark Public Library and several others. Plus, new poll numbers show a nail-biter of a congressional race to replace a retiring Republican. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. The audit report on NJ Transit is 179 pages long, but its conclusion boils down to a sentence or so. The struggling rail lines low on funding, planning, and morale without any fast fixes. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. This audit is what will allow us to begin rebuilding NJ Transit and restore faith in its operations. Five months in the making, the $1.3 million audit points out what every rail rider already knows. NJ Transit's cash-starved and poorly run, infuriatingly inept at communicating with commuters and lacking strategic vision. The buck stops at the top, where the audit recommends streamlining the agency's executive offices. For customers to know their concerns won't fall into a black hole, and for NJ Transit to run more smoothly and more transparently. We will put this in place. The audit calls for more reliable funding and finds current revenue streams inadequate, uncertain, and unsustainable. Governor Murphy's current budget, while it increased funding, relied in part on one-shot revenues. The governor cracked open the door to a possible fare hike next year. We're holding off on any fare hike, at least until next June 30th. In a perfect world, I'd love to see that go on even longer, but I'm not sure we're in a perfect world. I don't want commuters to get frightened by that conversation, be honest. Um, it's not a discussion that we've had. We're going to look at every other opportunity to adjust our finances that doesn't include the commuter. Interviews with 40 commuters led the audit company, North Highland, to recommend friendly or improved communication, especially reliable social network updates in real time. This agency is rotten to the core and it's going to take a lot of time and effort to get it back to where customers would like it to be. Customers need to be patient, but at the same time, there needs to be a lot of transparency. The audit also recommends simplifying and improving NJ Transit's recruitment process, noting it requires from five weeks to nine months or more to hire staff. One engineer didn't apply because he has heard trainers take pride in failing people. It also suggests NJ Transit develop a faster, more robust procurement process to replace failing equipment. It recommends an Office of Strategic Planning to develop a vision and roadmap for the agency, and it reports the governor damaged NJ Transit's employee morale when he called it a national disgrace. Murphy explained. It was a national disgrace, but it wasn't because of the hardworking men and women who came to work every day. Many of the audit recommendations can be done administratively. Some require legislation. Democrats drafted a reform bill months ago with bipartisan support, and Senator Loretta Weinberg said the audit underscores the urgent need for major structural changes at NJ Transit, starting with the creation of a stronger board of directors. We need to set strict requirements for public hearings for both schedule changes and fair increases. I think the most important thing we can do is find the efficiencies first. What's working, what's not working, what's duplicative, and what is yesterday's technology. Then going forward, we can identify on a bipartisan basis ways to have better funding streams. Whatever legislative initiatives are needed to make this right, we're here to do it. Let's just make it happen. Sponsors will amend the reform bill to include recommendations from the audit. That's expected to move through the legislature by the end of the month. Finding the extra millions of dollars and funding for NJ Transit will probably take a lot longer.
In Metuchen, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. The state is spending $225 million to have two government offices built in Trenton, but this time, Trenton residents are being offered a piece of the action. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports. Most cities would probably welcome new buildings, but Trenton stakeholders have never been fans of these two. A last-minute Christie administration plan to construct new office buildings for the health and the taxation departments. But with new administrations in Trenton, one at the State House and the other at City Hall, those same stakeholders say they're trying to make the best of it now. New Mayor Reed Gashara was part of a lawsuit to stop the buildings. This is a city that's eager to work, e eager to get to work. Um, so we want to work with the, um, the treasurer and the governor uh, to make sure that our workers are engaged in this project, that they hire local contractors, minority-based, and I think we still can get something positive out of the project. The mayor and the new state treasurer were at a networking event for small minority and women-owned businesses today, spreading the word that this administration is all in on a Trenton turnaround. I have really high hopes um, for the city, and it, it's, a, it's a great city, really um, uh, engaged and passionate people um, who have lived here a long time, and they want to see the city succeed, so we want to help be part of that. Potential vendors met with contractors scheduled to build the new offices to discuss ways that small businesses run by women and minorities might be able to get a piece of the 400,000 square feet of new construction. The state is providing training, waiving fees in some cases, and providing a way for businesses to qualify for more public work. A good first step, but African American Chamber of Commerce CEO John Harmon says he's been here before. The Marriott was uh, 63 million. Waterfront Park was, uh, I think it was another 60 some odd million. Um, and the, uh, the school construction initiative, which was about an eight to $12 billion statewide initiative, but when all the checks were cash, Trenton and cities like Trenton still had the highest poverty, limited capacity, and high unemployment. Harmon says he's hopeful that Murphy's stronger and fairer approach, that includes a better shot for the little guy, will lead to more opportunities. Some are already seeing change. Realtor Farida Stokes was here looking for broker opportunities at the new projects and says the Trenton real estate market is starting to percolate. One of the things that my company has is a contract with a number of different banks who uh, put properties on the market after they've been foreclosed on. And um, because of the, um, the inventory that's out here, uh, we have a number of people who are really looking, whether it be to purchase and live in or um, from investment aspects, uh, who are really picking up a lot of these properties. And that means more people living here in the city that used to be home to about 130,000 people, with a current population of around 80,000, which even a pessimist would admit leaves the capital city with a lot of room to grow. In Trenton, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. A new investment arrangement tops tonight's business news. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Scheffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, the mayor of Hoboken, Ravi Bala, today announced a development deal that he says will serve as a model for all future agreements in the city. The deal was reached with KMS Development, which is building a new Hilton Hotel along the waterfront. After negotiations with city council members, KMS agreed to increase its financial investment in the community to $4.5 million. That money will be used for infrastructure improvements, education funding, and potential restoration of the city's old YMCA. Mayor Bala says he's putting developers on notice if they want to do business in Hoboken, he expects generous community givebacks. New Jersey real estate faces serious risk from rising sea levels. That's one of the findings in a paper published by Rutgers University, which reviewed 20 recent studies on rising tides. Rutgers scientists have already estimated a likely sea level rise in New Jersey of one to two feet by the year 2050. According to Press of Atlantic City, this newly published paper concludes it's possible the sea level could rise by 10 feet in the Garden State by the year 2100. Should that occur, it's estimated $190 billion worth of real estate would be permanently flooded. 
Another survey on the fiscal health of states ranks New Jersey near the bottom. The Garden State ranks 48th in a study conducted by the Mercatus Center of George Mason University. Only Connecticut and Illinois ranked lower. It's probably no surprise that this study, as others have pointed out, cites New Jersey's unfunded liabilities as a reason for its low ranking. The report looked at a 10-year period of data and concluded New Jersey had a, quote, consistently weak fiscal performance. Mortgage rates have jumped above 5%, which could have implications for the real estate market. Historically, 5% is a low rate for conventional fixed-rate mortgages, but still, this means mortgage rates are now sitting at eight-year highs. On Wall Street, stocks closed mixed today. The Dow dropped 56 points. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. With just 28 days of campaigning left before the midterm election, new poll numbers are out in a battleground race considered key to which party controls Congress. It's the race for the right to represent New Jersey's 11th congressional district. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron will be moderating a debate between the candidates tomorrow, but he's with us tonight. Michael, how close is it? Mary Alice, the race in the 11th is very close. In the Monmouth poll released today, Democrat Mikey Sherrill leads Republican Jay Weber by four points, 48 percent to 44 percent. We spoke to pollster Patrick Murray. Mikey Sherrill has a statistically insignificant lead uh, in everything that we've done. We've not seen anything move all that much since the summer. There hasn't been a lot of momentum one way or the other, or it's either counteracted that. Uh, the big thing about this district is that, at its core, it's still a Republican district. Uh, that they prefer Republicans. Uh, they, you know, generally have a Republican sensibility. But two things: uh, they like Mikey Sherrill better than they like Jay Weber. And even though they're Republicans, they're not really happy with a number of things that the Republicans have done, and they're not happy with some of the things that Donald Trump has done. Murray asked respondents whether the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation fight affected their choice. 10% said it made them more likely to vote for Weber. 8% said it made them more likely to vote for Cheryl. 78% said it had not caused them to change their vote at all. This is the third district we've polled now since that uh, controversy broke uh, a little over a week ago. And in all of these districts, and New Jersey's 11th is no different, is that it really isn't moving the needle. Uh, you know, the vast majority of voters say they're not changing their mind because of this. And even those who say that they're going to change their mind really are partisan voters. They're Democrats or Republicans who were already kind of toying with knowing that they were going to vote for their party's nominee and just kind of this solidified for it. Despite the slight preference for, Demo for the Democrat Cheryl in the head-to-head -head against Weber, when asked which party they'd prefer to see control Congress, 45 percent of 11th District voters said the Republicans, 42 percent said the Democrats. This is a Republican district. This is a district that, under any other circumstances, would prefer to vote by a Republican for a Republican or would do so by large margins. But this is not normal circumstances. Uh, these are New Jersey Republicans uh, who tend to not to be, uh, many of them, tend not to be happy with the way Trump has conducted himself. They tend not to be happy with uh, the tax cuts plan, particularly the loss of the SALT deduction, which impacts this district much more than it probably impacts almost any other district in the country. Country, uh, in a negative way. Um, and those are the kinds of things that they kind of scratch their heads and say, which direction is my Republican Party going? Mikey Sherrill has presented herself as a kind of a solid uh, candidate with a military background. Uh, we find that uh, she has significantly uh, uh, positive uh, favorable ratings, uh, more so than, than Jay Weber does. And, you, you know, put that little package together. And that's why, at least in the polling right now, she's able to overcome the underlying fundamental edge that you would think a Republican would have in this district. So the race is still up for grabs. The candidates, Cheryl and Weber, will be here tomorrow night for a live debate, which I'll be moderating. You can watch it on air or online from 8 to 9.30. Mary Alice? 
Thank you, Michael. Two other polls don't give U.S. Senator Bob Menendez much breathing room. A Mason-Dixon poll for Telemundo shows one in five Hispanic voters are undecided about him. And a CBS poll says his high unfavorables following his federal corruption trial make his 10-point, 49 to 39 percent lead more like a dead heat. Today, Menendez called his challenger, former pharmaceutical executive Bob Pugin, a fraud. In 2010, Bob Eugen and Selgin were charged by the Justice Department, New Jersey, and dozens of other states in a whistleblower lawsuit with defrauding Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, the VA health system, marketing its drugs for unapproved purposes, lying to uh, and about the drug's efficacy and side effects, and orchestrating a kickback scheme that paid physicians to prescribe Revlimid. Well, the Hugen team fired back, calling Menendez a hypocrite and a liar. His press secretary writing, quote, while President Obama's Department of Justice investigated Bob Menendez and indicted him for bribery and corruption, there was no action taken against Celgene. Bob Menendez took money from Celgene's PAC because he agrees that the company has had a positive impact on cancer patients. Politics are roiling the Miss America organization, even after the crown's been won and the pageant's done. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Atlantic City, where even before this year's pageant, 44 state executive directors and 30 former Miss Americas were calling for the resignations of board chair Gretchen Carlson and CEO Regina Hopper over concerns about changes they made, including canceling the swimsuit competition. Now, the Miss America organization Organization has fired off letters to all 51 state organizations terminating the licensing contracts of at least four state title competitions and asking other state pageant organizers to explain why they aided the rebellion. Among those out, Pennsylvania. New Jersey's pageant officials first backed the mutiny, then backed out. Stay tuned. Next to English Town, where they really got down in the mud, the brave hearts who tackled the tough mudder competition swam and slogged and climbed and monkey barred their way over, under, around, and through rigorous mud infused obstacle courses. The 24 hour endurance event offered some 25 different trials by mud, suitable for different levels of athleticism, any one of them enough to have contestants climbing the wall. Finally, Bayonne, where a World War II veteran has left his alma mater a lasting legacy. William Gower graduated from Bayonne High in 1937 and went on to a successful career in engineering. He died two years ago at the age of 97 and has left the school an endowment of $2 million. Pending court approval, the William Gower Perpetual Scholarship Fund will provide college scholarships for students hoping to pursue STEM careers. And that's the Garden State Express for Tuesday, October 9th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. The fall is high season for collisions with deer. The State Department of Environmental Protection estimates the deer population has been cut in half since 1995 to about 100,000. Still, State Farm estimated last October that New Jersey drivers have a 1 in 229 chance of crashing into a deer. Leah Mishkin has this report. I want to say it was three right here. You see it kind of blocked, you know, was a natural okay. barrier here. Berkeley Heights resident Lisa Romenko got rid of her apple trees because they attracted too many deer. How many the apples. would you have sometimes? Oh, we happens. would have like a big buck with, you know, a whole family of deer. She lives right on the back of a reservation on the border of Somerset County, which AAA says is among the top five counties where deer crashes happen most often. Monmouth, Burlington, Hunterdon, and Morris also made the list in 2016. And you want, you know, a neighborhood with trees and all that kind of stuff but it promotes more deer and then right. they come out and you just don't see them. Because people are hitting them because they cross, you know, um, busy roads. 
So yeah, you, you'll find them kind of littered throughout the area um, where people drive. My husband actually had one just run right into the side of his car. New numbers from AAA show there were over 4,000 crashes in the state involving deer just in a three month span. So we just pulled over our car because we saw this sign here that indicates there were deer in this area. We haven't seen any just yet, but AAA does say they typically come out between five and seven o'clock at night. And that is when deer are typically out looking for food. So that's when our visibility is poor, the deer are out and about, and we tend to see an increase in crashes. AAA spokesperson Tracy Noble says the months of October through December are the time of year where they're seeing an increase in deer-related crashes. This is deer mating season, so uh, deer are looking for a potential partner. They are not paying attention to traffic safety. So AAA says you should scan the shoulder of the road. Slow down, especially in wooded areas. If there are no other cars around, use your high beams. Follow the speed limit. And remember, deer do not travel alone. Now, if a crash is unavoidable. Well, we do recommend that you do not jam on your brakes because what then happens is the car, the front of the car will dip down. So you don't want to do that. And you also want to stay in the lane because you never know what's coming in the other lane. So sometimes it could be better to actually strike the animal than to be in a head on collision with another vehicle. If you hit a deer, AAA says don't go near the injured animal, but call police because they can be unpredictable, as demonstrated in this video from the Howell Police Department. In Berkeley Heights, Leah Mishkin. NJTV News. There's nothing that can transport you farther than a good book. And now the Newark Public Library has new technology that can enhance the reading experience for people who struggle to see. Michael Hill has the story. Yeah. Newark Public Library has become the latest chapter in the state to launch the Library Equal Access Program, or LEAP. What is it? It's about providing important skills on how to use things like assistive technology, such as magnification and audio reading, and audio reading tools to help visually impaired users with reading websites, emails, and other documents, really providing that essential bridge to all of the information resources that many of the rest of us take for granted, but that are vital to sort of keeping up with the way the world works today. LEAP turns the page on access to the internet for the blind and visually impaired through beginner level assistive technology software training, thanks to the new technology installed on the library's computers and iPads. If you're listening to what it's reading, it's saying news. The commission's Colleen Fopel did a show and tell. TV, notes. So I hear notes. I double tap on the screen. I don't have to tap on the icon itself. I just heard, oh, that's what I want. I go into it. Now in here, I can do two things. I can move my hand around the top, and it'll read as I'm moving my finger, whatever I touch. And that can be just me trying to explore, because I don't know what's on the screen. Before this major technological upgrade here at the Newark Public Library and several others across the state, what would the blind and visually impaired have to do to access computers and so forth here? I have to wait on somebody. I have to call somebody. The State Library and the Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired partnered to make this vision a reality. We bring the community that hopefully will benefit from the services and um, they bring some of the money and some of the expertise. Newark Council President Mildred Crump is a longtime advocate for the blind who's taught Braille for 40 years, including, she says, to Stevie Wonder. This for me is a glorious day. Newark native and Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver recalled coming to this library to take out books when she was a kid. Now she has another story this building can tell. Access to information in the 21st century is crucial. And not having the ability to have access to resources that can be easily used by visually impaired people is really a barrier to being fully engaged uh, in the mainstream of our life. In Newark, Michael Hill, NJTV News. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Now, so 
some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. The New Jersey Transit Auto released today cost the state $1.3 million. The largest minority group in New Jersey, according to the U.S. Census, are Hispanics. The number of visually impaired people in New Jersey, according to the National Federation of the Blind, is around 163,000. And the number of crashes in New Jersey involving deer in just a three-month span, AAA says it's more than 4,000. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, who investigates when law enforcement is accused of violating civil rights? Followed by the first of our weekly debates ahead of the midterm elections, Mikey Sherrill and Jay Weber square off right here. And you can join the debate on air or online starting at 8 o'clock. That's tomorrow. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Have some water. So Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.